Man, last year was such a good year for the boys. I mean, they made the playoffs, and they actually held their own for a bit instead of just being swept or something. They've got a great group of guys down there. Hopefully this year they can break through. Oh, man. I can't wait for the next exciting season of Rays baseball. So, uh, this coronavirus thing just shut down the entire world, and with it, all professional sports as well. All of a sudden, we went from spring training hype to being unsure if we were even getting baseball this year. It was an uncertain time, but as the months carried on, MLB finally announced play would begin in late July with a 60-game season. Empty stadiums, an expanded playoff, and frequent medical testing ensured that this year would be quite different from years past. Of course, it was better than no games at all, but how would the Rays hold up in this unique environment? Well, they were used to playing in empty stadiums anyway. <laughs> After letting go of Aguilar and Matt Duffy, the Rays hoped to bring the power with the signing of Yoshimoto Tsutsugo, and Tommy Pham was traded in exchange for Hunter Renfro. And... Interesting move, to be sure. Let's see what Snell has to say about it. We give a fam up for Renfro and a damn slap dick prospect? Pagan would be swapped for outfielder Manuel Margot, and they would also send some guys away to St. Louis in exchange for middling prospect Randy Rosarena. I'm sure he won't amount to anything. With the shortened season set to go, the Rays opened things with an underwhelming 4-6 and six start. But their luck would turn around as August saw three separate winning streaks of at least five games. And an astounding 21-7 record put them comfortably in first place. In September, their momentum continued. And on the 23rd, they clinched the division for the first time in a decade, finishing 40-20. Yeah, that season summary was pretty short, but I mean, you're only playing 60 games. There isn't exactly much to talk about. While the offense took a bit of a backstep from last year, especially with Yoshi and Redfro underperforming, guys like Lowe, Adamas, and Diaz continued their stride this year, with Lau hitting 14 homers. Randy got some playing time when he got called up, and he made an impact, hitting 7 homers in 23 games. The real surprise was Mike Brasso, utility guy who was pretty good at getting on base. The most notable moment came on September 1st, when Brasso came up to hit against Aroldis Chapman in the ninth inning. Chapman, being the gentleman that he is, threw a 100 mile per hour fastball right to the head, with Brasso barely ducking out of the way. Needless to say, the Rays were not happy, especially with Chapman's tough guy walk afterwards. Like, bro, come on, you're not that cool. Need to remind you of what happened last year. After the game, Cash was definitely not happy, and he had some words to say. Somebody's got to be accountable, and the last thing I'll say on it is I got a whole damn stable full of guys that throw 98 miles an hour, period. The next day, Brasso would get revenge, smacking two homers, and the Rays would win the division over New York. This was mostly achieved due to the stellar pitching, with the trio of Glasnow, Snell, and Morton forming a formidable trio. The bullpen did their job, leading the league in saves, with Nick Anderson having a breakout year, putting up a 0.55 ERA. Aside from him, newcomers Pete Fairbanks and Aaron Loop provided good reinforcements. The Rays entered the playoffs as the favorites to represent the American League, but their road to their first title would be a long one. With the expanded playoffs, the Rays had to face the Blue Jays in the wildcard round, which was expanded to a best of three. Now Toronto being the young team that they were, came in with no expectations as the number eight seed. And it didn't take much for the Rays to overcome them, as dominant pitching from Snell got them the first game, and a grand slam from Renfro helped seal the deal and clinch the series win. With the ALDS, the Rays had to travel to a neutral site, playing all their games in San Diego. And here they would meet a familiar foe. Man, this feels a lot like Boston back in the old days, huh? In 
In Game 1, the teams exchanged runs, with an Aaron Hicks sack fly answered with a Randy Homer, and a Clint Frazier shot answered with Choi hitting one of his own. However, a pair of homers from Kyle Higashioka and Aaron Judge put the Yankees up 4-3 to three heading into the ninth, where John Curtis would get into a pickle. Having already given up a run and facing a bases-loaded situation with Giancarlo Stanton up to bat, and, well, he put the game away. Game 2 saw Randy and Zanino hit more homers, and Margot would add on to build a 5-1 lead. Stanton would once again cause trouble, making it a one-run game in the fourth, but the Rays were able to hold on for the win. Game 3 saw Charlie Morton continue his dominant presence with another strong start, and Kiermaier hitting a three-run blast to put the Rays up 4-1. They would continue to pile on with a home run from catcher Michael Perez, and a double from Choi, en route to a big 8-4 win. With a 2-1 series lead, the Rays headed into Game 4 with confidence, but the opener backfired on them with Ryan Thompson giving up 2 in the second. Lau was able to cut the deficit in half, and the game remained close until a Glaber Torres homer extended the lead to 4-1 and the offense was unable to get anything going, as New York forced a decisive Game 5. All the stops were pulled for this game, with Glasnow only going two and a third innings before being pulled at the first sign of trouble. Anderson, who'd been dominant all year, gave up a homer to Judge to give the Yankees the lead, as he was stretched to two and two-third innings. Garrett Cole, who shut the Rays down last year, was again putting up a solid performance, but Austin Meadows was able to break through in the fifth, tying the game. It would remain a tight pitching duel, with there being only six hits total for both teams the entire game. Heading into the eighth, Chapman was brought in to keep the Rays at bay, and once again, he was met by Mike Brasso. Hey, remember when Papelbon said those things in 08 and then karma bit him in the ass? Well, history often tends to repeat itself. 3-2, Brasso sends one into left field. Gardner going back, and it is up and gone! Mike Brasso has homered! And the Rays have a 2-1 to one lead! What a moment for Brasso! With three outs to get, Diego Castillo came in in the ninth. And after striking out Stanton and Luke Voigt, Gio Urshela hit a liner to third that would have been bad had it not been for Wendell being in the exact right spot to make the catch. The ALCS saw a rematch against the Astros, who, despite entering the playoffs with a losing record, dispatched the Twins and A's to reach their fourth straight ALCS. Looking to get revenge, Randy continued his hot streak with another homer, and the pitching shut things down in a close Game 1 win. Game 2 saw the Rays presented with a good opportunity early on, with Randy hitting a single and Choi reaching on an error. That brought up Manuel Margot who proceeded to blast one into center for a three-run shot. The very next inning, Houston had a chance with two on and two out, as George Springer hit a ball into foul territory. It should have landed out of play, but Margot was able to leap over the fence and make the catch and keep it in his glove as he toppled over and landed on the concrete floor. Morton once again shut down his former team, and the Rays put this one away for another win. In Game 3, Jose Altuve struck first with a homer, but in the 6th, the race went off. 
as they got the bases loaded with one out. Wendell would knock in a run, and a hit by pitch on Adamus would bring in another, but it would be Renfro that would make the statement with a bases clearing double that would put the game out of reach. With the Rays one win away from the World Series, they looked to glass now to bring it home, but the Astros were able to score a couple early to take the lead. Randy would answer with yet another homer to tie it up, but Glasnow would bend once again, surrendering the lead to a Springer homer. The Rays had a chance to tie it, as an Adamas double brought in Wendell to make it 4-3, and a wild pitch brought him to third base, but Yoshi would line out, and Houston would avoid the sweep. Game 5 was another back and forth affair, as Michael Brantley would put the Astros in front 3-1. However, a pair of homers from Randy and Choi would tie the game up. The Rays once again would put their trust in Anderson, who got through the 8th cleanly before facing Carlos Correa in the 9th, where he once again showed signs of mortality. Correa's watching, this is back! Gee, Anderson, that's your second showing this postseason where you gave up a homer. Surely it doesn't get worse, right? With the pressure mounting, Adamas gave some hope with a double to take the lead in Game 6, but Castillo would melt down in the fifth, giving up three runs. Add on a couple more, and Houston jumped out to a 7-1 lead. And despite Margot doing his best to bring his team back, the Astros were able to win yet again and the Rays saw their 3-0 lead completely evaporate. Only once has a team come back from down 3-0 to win the series, the 2004 Red Sox over the Yankees, and the Rays were desperate to avoid that same fate, as everything came down to Game 7. Luckily, they had their ace Charlie Morton on the mound, who would once again go five and two-thirds innings of scoreless baseball. Randy would continue to mash, hitting his seventh homer in the postseason, passing Longoria for the team record, and Zanino would add on with a homer and sack fly to make it 4 nothing. Anderson would go two innings once again, giving up three hits, not exactly the solid performance we're used to seeing from him. And while he didn't give up anything directly, shortly after he left, Correa would bring in two on an RBI single, and Anderson would be charged the runs. Nonetheless, Fairbanks would step up once again as he protected a 4-2 lead in the ninth, striking out three before Aledmiz Diaz would hit a fly ball that landed softly in Margot's glove. And the Tampa Bay Rays have just won the American League pennant. For the second time in franchise history, the Rays are on their way to the World Series. Fireworks in the sky, the celebration explodes out of the first base dugout, and the Rays, for the second time ever, will play in the Fall Classic. For the second time in franchise history, the Rays had won the AL pennant in a year that saw many ups and downs, and where they almost choked it away in historic fashion. But they pulled through like they have all year. And now 12 years after losing to the Phillies, the Rays traveled to Texas for a chance at revenge. Their opponent would be the Los Angeles Dodgers holders of the best record in the National League, and an absolute juggernaut of a team. They had just completed a 3-1 comeback against the Braves in the NLCS, and had made their third World Series appearance in four years. However, they lost the previous two, and looked very eager to finally win their first title since 1986. They were even led by Andrew Friedman, former GM of the Rays, as they represented what the Rays could be if they actually had a decent payroll. Stu, being the cheap ass as usual, had the team post the third lowest payroll in baseball, while the Dodgers had the highest. It seemed like the Rays had no chance, 
but they couldn't have come this far just to lose. Who knows when or even if they'll make it this far ever again. And with the looming lease deadline, they had to make the most of every opportunity given to them. They had to play like baseball in the bay depended on it. Game 1 saw Tyler Glass now against the mighty Clayton Kershaw, but the Rays were able to hold their own, with Cody Bellinger and Kiermaier homers leaving the game at 2-1 in the 5th, where the Dodgers offense would break through, roughing up Glass now, Yarbs, and Josh Fleming, cruising to a crushing Game 1 loss. When the Rays needed to bounce back, they got it with a crucial Wendell double that drove in 2 in Game 2 and a pair of Brandon Lau homers to build a big lead. LA was able to make it interesting, cutting it down to 6-4 with help from Will Smith and Corey Seager. But the bullpen came through once again, evening the series at 1, despite Anderson giving up another run, but it's okay, he's fine. You know why they won this game? I'll tell you why. Remember back in 08 when little baby me was munching on a hot dog at game 2? Well... They won that game, and 12 years later, the tradition continued. Yeah, I wasn't actually at the game because 1. Tickets were super expensive, and 2. It was in Texas. But hey, the hot dog is 2-0 in World Series games. But it only works in Game 2, unfortunately. Charlie Morton, who had been dominant all postseason, began to show signs of weakness as the Dodgers offense got to him early in Game 3. With a 2-RBI single from Max Muncy and efforts from Austin Barnes and Mookie Betts, putting LA up 5-0. Ultimately, the offense couldn't do anything against Walker Buehler and Kenley Jensen, as despite another Randy Homer, the Rays would fall once again. In a critical Game 4, the Rays would trust in their bullpen to come through, though Justin Turner and Corey Seager homers would give the Dodgers the early lead. Randy was able to get one back with his ninth homer in the postseason to make it 2-1, but Muncy would answer with a single to restore the two-run lead. The teams would continue to jostle back and forth, a run for a homer answered by a double from Enrique Hernandez. A loud three-run shot responded with a Jock Peterson double scoring two that came yet again off Nick Anderson, who would give up another run to Seager in the eighth to make it 7-6, to six, continuing his playoff woes. In the ninth, the Dodgers would once again summon Kenley Jensen to finish it off. And things seemed to be working out, as despite Kiermaier getting on base after the ball just barely missing Hernandez's glove, Yoshi and Wendell would both be out, leading to Randy taking the plate with two outs. In a long, arduous at-bat, Randy was able to work the count, and on 3-2, and two, the ball fell to the dirt to get Randy on base. And with two men on in the bottom of the ninth in Game 4 of the World Series, up to the plate steps Brett Phillips. Phillips is a man who's been struggling to stay on a major league roster, despite having promising potential. He spent a long time in the Houston minor league system before being shipped to Milwaukee, where he would make his MLB debut in 2017, where he put up fine numbers. His production soon declined, however, and he was shipped to Kansas City, where he did even worse. On August 27th, he was picked up by the Rays in a trade, and while he didn't play that much, he relished in the opportunity of being able to play for his hometown team. Having grown up in Seminole, Phillips watched the Rays play his entire childhood, witnessing the incredible run in 2008. And of course, the dream of any little leaguer is to have the game-winning hit, especially in the World Series. But Phillips was only a bench player, having not played the entire ALCS, and only having three at-bats this entire postseason. And yet, here he is, in the bottom of the ninth, with two outs, hoping to bring home the win. After a ball and a strike, Jensen's pitch hits the corner for a questionable strike call, 
and now the rays are down to their final strike. Hey, wait a minute. This seems familiar. The hometown kid coming up with the biggest hit of his life to win the game for his team in the World Series. It sounds like a good movie script, right? Right about now, the happy music would be playing and the credits would be rolling. However, this isn't a movie. This is real life. And this isn't the end of the series, as despite the incredible heroics, the Rays had to go out the next night to do it all again. Game 5 saw Glasnow once again struggle on the mound, as he gave up 3 in the first 2 innings. However, the Rays were able to respond with a triple from Diaz and a Randy RBI, cutting it down to 3-2. to two. They had another chance with Margot on 3rd in the 4th, but he was caught trying to steal home? Bro, trying to steal home in the World Series? Especially with Margot, a guy who isn't exactly super fast? A questionable move for sure. A Muncie homer would make it 4-2, and the offense would struggle once again to get anything going until the 8th, where they had a 1st and 2nd with 1 out and Randy up to bat. In what should have been a golden opportunity, he instead hit a ball that wound up just short, and Lau would line out to end the inning. Ultimately, the offense sputtered once again, and the Rays dropped Game 5, and now faced elimination. To get some good luck, I remember watching Moneyball before Game 6, a movie that embodied the spirit of the small market team. A group of guys who feel the baseball world is against them, and with not a lot of money to spare, they use analytics to determine which players have real value, and transform the Oakland A's into a division winner in 2002. Sure, they lost in the ALDS, but the strategy was set. And as the years went on, no team embodied Moneyball quite like the Rays, who had continual playoff success despite their small payroll. They've been able to make two World Series appearances with a bunch of guys who, on other teams, would be seen as random castaways. But now, they needed everything they got to force a Game 7. Randy set the tone early with his 10th homer of the postseason, and Snell would pitch the game of his life throwing five innings of one-hit ball. Sure, the Rays had the lead, 
but that potent Dodgers offense could only be held for so long. And in the bottom of the sixth, after getting out A.J. Pollock, Barnes was able to get it on with a single. It's alright, only his second hit allowed, and wait, why is Cash coming out of the dugout? Wait, what? He's taking Snell out? But why? I mean, he's been pitching so good. Okay, 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 okay. I think I get it. You're on the brink of elimination. You don't want to take any risks. I mean, he's only thrown 73 pitches. But maybe I can understand wanting to get the best possible chance of success. I mean, that's why I'm not the coach and Cash is. Now, as long as they replace him with someone good, they can... No. No. No, you're bringing in Anderson? The guy who's been getting cooked all postseason? Hasn't he thrown enough already? Oh, you couldn't have gone with somebody else? No, 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 please. Oh my god. You can't do this, Cash. You had to... You had anybody else. You couldn't pick anybody else. You had to pick... Anderson, oh my god, he gave up the fucking lead. You've got to be kidding me. Now they're losing. Oh my god. Why did you put Anderson in? He has to be tired. He has to be cooked. He sucks now. He's thrown so much. Cash, what are you thinking? What are you fucking doing? You're going to lose the fucking World Series. You all know the classic story. David vs. Goliath, the big bad man being taken down by the plucky underdog. It's a story that resonates a lot in sports. Underdogs are always fun to root for, as it's nice to see the little guy take the win every now and then. Sure, the big teams will be stronger and have the advantage in practically every department, but the underdogs are there to prove that it's still possible for the smaller team to win sometimes. The Tampa Bay Rays are the epitome of the underdog. A team with a small payroll playing in a bad stadium with low attendance. An owner threatening to relocate them. They're unable to keep big name players when they get too expensive. And are always looking for the cheapest possible option. Yet, despite everything, they still persevere. They've been able to craft not just a good team, but a great team. A team that took them to within two wins of a title. But alas, life doesn't always have a happy ending. And for the Rays, there is no solace found here. It would later come out that Anderson was dealing with arm troubles during the postseason, which hampered his performance, though he still kept quiet about it. Had he said something to Cash, maybe he would have went with somebody else. Had he brought in Castillo, or Fairbanks, or anyone else. Who knows what would have happened. Maybe the Rays hold off the Dodgers and force Game 7, and from there, anything could happen. Maybe, in an alternate timeline, the Rays rallied and won their first championship in franchise history, and the team came up with a deal to build a new stadium and keep the Rays in the Bay. And then they celebrated with a big boat parade like their brothers in the Tampa Bay region. I mean, hell, the Lightning got to enjoy two Stanley Cups during this time, and the Bucks won a Super Bowl in their home stadium. The Rays were destined to win. We'll never know what could have happened, because the reality is, the Rays came up short once again. They'd come closer than ever before in reaching the mountaintop, only to tumble all the way back down. Was it a successful year? Absolutely. Did it tremendously suck how it ended? Of course. But, in the end, it'd just be nice to see them win. One day.
2021 didn't see a whole lot of roster changes as Blake Snell, two years off his Cy Young season, was traded to the Padres for Luis Patino and Francisco Mejia. While both Patino and Mejia have been alright, Snell has continued to play well in San Diego, earning another Cy Young in 2023. The offseason also saw the departure of Morton and a few relievers, a tradition of the Rays being unable to re-sign big names. But hey, they got Rich Hill, who actually had an alright campaign, as well as the return of Chris Archer? Now hold on, let's re-examine that Pittsburgh trade real quickly. In return for Archer, the Rays got Meadows, who was a 2019 All-Star and hit 106 RBIs in 2021, and Glasnow, who put up solid numbers from 2018 to 2021. Okay, but what about the player to be named later? Well, that would become Shane Boz, who, while his playing time has been limited due to injuries, he's still been good enough. Meanwhile, Archer struggled mightily in Pittsburgh, having his worst season in 2019, and in 2020, he didn't even play. And so, as a free agent, he was picked up by the Rays, concluding one of the worst trades in Pirates history, and a lesson that, if Neander is calling, be cautious of his trade offers. Archer only played six games before injuries derailed his season, and the very next year he was in Minnesota. But Meadows had a great year, and Glass, in the time he did play, was also good. With new holes in the rotation, somebody had to step up, and that man was USF alumni Shane McClanahan. Now, he had pitched last year, even throwing in the postseason, but his numbers were, uh, let's just say, not good. Here, though, he reformed into a solid number two behind Glasnow, though that would eventually become number one as he had to get Tommy John in June. One year removed from the World Series, and the rotation already looked completely different, with McClanahan, Hill, Michael Waka, Josh Fleming, and Louis Patino doing a serviceable job. The bullpen remained elite, with Andrew Kittredge and Colin McHugh being huge players, as well as depth guys like Drew Rasmussen, J.P. Fireisen, Lewis Head, Ryan Thompson, Matt Whistler, I could go on. This 2021 bullpen might be the best the Rays have ever had, and it led to another year where the pitching dominated the AL. A bunch of guys would even come together to throw the Rays' second no-hitter, though it was only seven innings, and doesn't officially count, I guess. After a slow start in April, the Rays went on a torrid stretch, going 22-6 and in May, including an 11-game winning streak, one short of their record from 4 They cooled off a bit in June, and entering the All-Star break, they once again found themselves in the thick of the division hunt. Their efforts were helped out by All-Stars Joey Wendell and Mike Zanino, as they both could mash the shit out of the ball. I mean, Big Z was also just a beast in general. I mean, come on. Look at this picture and tell me this isn't the coolest man on the team. As Adamas was sent to the Brewers, Randy Choi and newcomer Mejia stepped in to fill the void. And in the deadline, the Rays picked up Nelson Cruz, a move that ended up backfiring spectacularly as he proceeded to suck. But eh, what can you do? Brett Phillips even had a good year, as at one point he hit three grand slams and an inside the parker in just 19 days. The first person to do that since Babe fucking Ruth. He would also make a pitching appearance and somehow threw a 94 mile per hour fastball before immediately going back to usual expectations. There was also one more man who made his introduction in 2021, that being superstar prospect Wander Franco, who hit a homer in his debut in late June. Aside from being a solid hitter, he was also great defensively, filling in the hole at shortstop. Man, what a great ball player he is. The Rays followed up their impressive May with an equally impressive August, going 21-6, and as they all but ran away with the division. On October 2nd, they would defeat the Yankees to win 100 games for the first time in franchise history, 
in the process, also putting up what might be the best raised team ever assembled. And yet, despite the best season in franchise history, the Montreal bullshit continued, with Stu remaining adamant about the split city plan. And in an absolutely insane move, they plan to advertise the plan with a sign during the playoffs, claiming increased support from fans. Yeah, when they got off the crack they were smoking and saw the immense backlash they received, it wasn't long before the sign was scrapped. But the damage still lingered, as it seemed like they were unwilling to explore any more options in Tampa Bay. Man, not even the Canadians were happy. Nonetheless, the Rays looked poised to defend their pennant and face their old friends, the Red Sox, in the ALDS. Things started off great, with RBIs from Franco and Diaz and a Cruz homer to put them up. Randy would continue his playoff prowess with another homer, and then, in the seventh, he was walked. Then a double advanced him to third base. And remembering Margot's pitiful attempt to steal home last year, Randy showed the world how you actually do it. McClanahan and the bullpen would throw a lights-out performance, sealing a Game 1 win. In Game 2, Boss got into some trouble early on and gave up a couple runs. But the Rays answered right back, with the bases loaded for a Yandy Diaz single, and then a grand slam by Jordan Luplo of all people, to put them up 5-2. They looked ready to make quick work of the Red Sox, but it wouldn't be that easy, as a couple homers would make it a one-run game. And in the fifth, they would pull away to an 8-5 lead. Choi would answer back to make it 8-6, but Boston would pile on. And when all was said and done, what had initially looked like an easy win turned into a Boston blowout. As the series shifted to Fenway, Meadows set the tone early with a two-run shot, but Boston answered back, making it 4-2 in the eighth. There, the Rays rallied with a home run from Franco and a Meadows double that set up Randy to also hit a double, tying the game. As it went into extras, the pitching duel continued until the 13th, where, with Yandi on first, Kiermaier would hit a deep ball into right field where it initially appeared to be a double that took the lead. But because of Fenway's absolutely stupid park design, the ball had bounced off the wall, then off Renfro, and flew over the Little League ass fence they had back there, resulting in a ground rule double. In any other ballpark, the ball would still be in play, and Yandi would have scored. But of course, because Fenway is special, it remained a tie game, where Zanino, of course, would strike out, ending the inning. And yeah, Christian Vasquez would end it in the bottom half with a walk-off homer. Things didn't get much better in Game 4, as after McHugh did a solid job, McClanahan came in the third and completely shit himself, giving up five runs, all with two outs. Yeah, he wasn't happy about that one. However, the Rays would slowly crawl back, with an RBI from Meadows and a Franco homer making it 5-3. And in the eighth, they rallied with three straight hits as a Randy single tied the game. Of course, in typical Rays fashion, they couldn't bring Randy home from second, but the game remained tied into the ninth, where Fireisen got into trouble with the winning run 90 feet away. And, well, he couldn't deliver. A disappointing end to an otherwise great season, as the Rays fumbled their greatest chance yet to make a deep run. 
Unlike other instances, this time the pitching failed them when it was needed, and so they went out to bolster their arms. Hill was replaced by Corey Kluber, and Rasmussen would evolve into a starter, being joined by Jeffrey Springs. During spring training, Meadows was dealt to the Tigers in exchange for Isak Berades, as well as acquiring D.H. Harold Ramirez. That all but finished the Delman Young trade tree, as jumping ahead a bit, Glasnow and Margot would be traded to the Dodgers for Ryan Pepiot and Johnny DeLuca. Overall, the Rays got quality production from a whole bunch of guys, including Garza, Bartlett, Fold, Archer, Meadows, Glasnow, and Paredes, while the Twins got absolutely hosed as Young and everybody else turned out to be busts. So, for the last time, thanks Twins! But the biggest news was the signing of Wander Franco to the biggest contract in team history. An 11-year, $182 million deal, locking down their superstar for the next decade. Also, Manfred finally got off his ass and killed the Montreal plan once and for all. And while the team still only had six seasons left to find a new place to play, at least they weren't doing some stupid split city bullshit. Twenty twenty two would be known as the year of the injuries, as a bunch of people would miss significant time, including Kiermaier, Zanino, and Wander. In his absence, resident bumfuck Taylor Walls would become the primary shortstop, being absolutely useless at the plate. But at least he was okay on defense. Despite Boz going down with Tommy John, the rotation remained as good as ever with McClanahan, Rasmussen, and Springs being the 1-2-3 combo the team needed. Rass even came close to perfection, as on August 14th, he was two outs away from a perfect game, before Jorge Mateo spoiled it with a double. The bullpen was led by Jason Adam, who was having a breakout year, as the rotating stable of guys once again put up good numbers. Despite this, the offense took a big step back, mainly due to people missing time. However, it did give some people some time to shine in their absence. Rookies Josh Lowe and Luke Rayleigh played a good time this year, as well as deadline pickups Jose Siri and David Peralta, with the former filling in nicely for Kiermaier. Yu Chang was claimed from Pittsburgh midway through the season, and in the short time he was in St. Pete, he played pretty well until he was sent to Boston. And with Zanino missing most of the season, Mejia and Christian Bethencourt filled the catching duties. However, it was a rough season. Tragically, Brett Phillips was DFA'd midway through the year, and he would never reach the highs of 2021 ever again. The 22 Rays were thoroughly mid, with injuries hampering them throughout the entire year. By July, the division race was basically over, and they spent the second half fighting for the wild card. Despite the addition of a third spot, they still struggled to put wins together, as they went 14-19 and in September and October. They limped to a playoff berth on September 30th, and literally collapsed and died right after, losing their last five games. Yeah, the might of last year's team was almost non-existent. But this poor team was still in the playoffs, where they would face the Guardians in the wildcard round, another team with a weak offense. Thus commenced the Battle of Mid, or the most boring playoff round of all time. The Rays actually held Cleveland to three runs, which is awesome. The only problem is they scored one. Yeah, one run all series. A solo shot from Siri in Game 1 was all they could muster, and even then that brief lead was immediately given up. Even the MLB didn't care about this series, as they put both games at a 12pm start time. Game 2 was agonizing to watch, as neither team could do a thing offensively. Fairbanks had to leave the game after loading the bases due to a blister, and Diaz, Franco, and Randy went an astounding 2 for 16 with 2 walks. 
The game dragged on into extras, going all the way into the 15th inning, where the Rays had a man on third base, only for both Mejia and Siri to go down in pathetic fashion. Finally, in the bottom of the 15th, in the longest scoreless postseason game up to that point, Oscar Gonzalez put the pitiful 2022 Rays out of their misery. In the offseason, the purge began, as Kiermaier, Sanino, Choi, Yarbrough, Kluber, and a whole bunch of relievers would go. And in response, the Rays signed Zach Eflin for three years. Yeah, that's about it. Needless to say, 2023 looked like it was going to be rough. But if 2013 was anything to go by, anything's possible. On December 2nd, 2022, an interesting development also occurred. A plan to redevelop the site around the trop, including a new stadium and surrounding amenities, like the Battery in Atlanta. Over the course of the spring, it ended up getting some support from St. Pete. And on September 19th, the team and the city officially announced they had a deal to build a new stadium. Sure, it's going to be right next to the trop, but they're also redeveloping the area around the park to hopefully attract more people. And maybe they'll even make the process of getting there not a complete shit show. As of the time of writing this, it still has to pass the city council vote. But if it gets done, the long search for a new ballpark will finally be over. And the Rays will remain in the bay for years to come. That optimism was carried into the 23 season, with the Rays getting off to a historic 13-0 start, tied for the best in Major League history. A 58-35 first half had the team sitting comfortably in first, but July would derail everything, as they went 8-16, including losing 3-4 to Baltimore, who had been on their heels for a while now. They would overtake the Rays in late July, and for the next couple months they jostled for first place. In September, they played a critical four-game series, and as Tampa Bay won the first two, they sat tied for first. However, Baltimore would win the next two, and would end up winning the division. The Rays still ended up with another great season, finishing with 99 wins, but they had to settle for the first wildcard spot. The offense rebounded after 2022, with Yandy Diaz having a career year, winning the AL batting title. Josh Lowe also had a breakout season, along with Paredes, who led the team in RBIs. Randy had morphed into the face of the franchise after his efforts in the World Baseball Classic, and he even got a special section of the stadium named after him, Randy Land. Despite regressing a little, he still played well enough to earn his first All-Star nomination, and he even played in the Home Run Derby. Unlike his predecessors, he actually did quite well besting his good friend Adolis Garcia before losing in the final to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. The team combined for 230 homers, a new franchise record. It was quite an interesting year that seemed to have it all, from Taylor Walls somehow hitting a grand slam in New York leading to this moment. Kyle, what just happened? No! to someone literally posting a picture of their own shit at the trop in the Rays Discord, to the reverse boycott in Oakland. Like the Rays, the A's also had attendance troubles, with ownership threatening relocation. However, while the Rays seemed to have figured things out with a new stadium, Oakland fans weren't so lucky, as the team announced they would be moving to Las Vegas in the near future. To combat this, a reverse boycott was held on June 13th against the Rays, where 28,000 fans protested the move. It's unfortunate to see such a fate befall such a dedicated fan base, especially when the Rays and A's have so much in common, both being small market teams with low payrolls that made it work with analytics and smart business decisions. Hell, the Rays even played the A's in their last playoff game with fans in attendance in Oakland, while the Rays got lucky, Oakland didn't, and the world of baseball is worse off for it. Things weren't all sunshine and rainbows, however, as the Rays lost McClanahan, Rasmussen, and Springs all to Tommy John. 
In their place, Eflin and Glasnow played well enough, along with a surprisingly strong performance from Zach Little. The bullpen was able to pick up some of the slack, with Fairbanks being as good as ever, along with Poche, Adam, Jake Diekman, Sean Armstrong, and Robert Stevenson, who would throw the first immaculate inning in Rays history. Which actually wasn't because there was an intentional walk, but who cares. The biggest blow, however, came in August, as Wander was placed on the restricted list after allegations came out that he had an affair with a 14-year-old girl. Now, Wander ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. Earlier in the year, he was benched due to behavioral problems. But this was unthinkable at the time. Now, with hindsight and new information, yeah, things don't look too good. The future superstar and potential Hall of Famer will now probably never play in the MLB again. And honestly, good riddance. Twenty twenty three was also a year of remembrance as it marked the twenty fifth anniversary of the team. To commemorate the milestone, the Rays Hall of Fame was founded, and along with Zimmer, Wade Boggs and Carl Crawford were also inducted, with the Rays winning all three of the games where ceremonies were held. Two statues were also erected outside of the ballpark, one of Aki ending the two thousand eight ALCS, and one of Longoria in game one sixty two. It was a joyous time, but also a somber one, as longtime radio announcer Dave Wills passed away before the season began. Over the course of his time with the team, he had the privilege of calling many great moments, from the 08 pennant run, to Game 162, to the crazy World Series walk-off. The team played the season in honor of him, and he is set to be inducted into the Team Hall of Fame in 2024, along with Fred McGriff. It really showed just how far they'd come as a team. Their first decade of existence saw them at the bottom of the barrel, but ever since 2008, they've had the third best record in baseball, only behind the Dodgers and Yankees, which, judging how much they spend compared to the Rays, is ludicrous. The 2023 postseason saw the Rays with a lot to prove, as they faced off against the Texas Rangers who had beaten them twice in a row in 2010 and 2011. Now this time, they had the home field advantage, and an offense that was strong, despite losing Lau and Rayleigh to injury. They had their top two guys in Glasnow and Eflin lined up for games one and two, and a strong bullpen to support them. Surely this will be an easy series win for them, right?
If 2022 was the worst playoff performance from the Rays, 2023 was somehow even worse. They got crushed twice in front of their own fans who didn't even sell out the stadium due to MLB scheduling these games at 3 p.m. on weekdays. And the offense once again crumbled into a ball and died. Carried over from last year, they went 33 innings without scoring a single run. Once again, only mustering up one the entire series. The Rays were completely and utterly embarrassed on all facets of the game. Baseball can kind of suck sometimes. It can feel like everything is against you. It can feel like the baseball gods have cursed this team to never win. But in the end, it's just a game. A game of chance. A game of luck. Sure, the Rays got super unlucky the past two years, but they're still a great team. If anything, the past few years have been really lucky as they've made the playoffs five times in a row, won their second pennant, and now are hopefully in place to finally get a new stadium. From the dreadful years of the Devil Rays, to the crazy highs of the late 2000s and early 2010s, to the uncertainty of the last decade, there has never been a better time to be a Rays fan. Sure, they'll trade away star players, like how they shipped off Glasnow, Margot, and Rayleigh, but they've always seemed to find a way to make it work. The Tampa Bay Rays look once again to be among the league's best in 2024, as they push for another playoff appearance. And from there, who knows? The playoffs are a crapshoot anyway, an entire season coming down to a small handful of games. Sometimes... Actually, most of the time, the best teams don't win. Sometimes luck doesn't favor you. But that's just how it is. Maybe one day, the Rays will put it all together and go on a run. They'll have a hitting core that can keep them in any game, a pitching staff that can hold down the fort, and a sea of loud fans cheering them on. A clutch hit, a big strikeout, everything leading them back to the World Series, where this time... They finally get over the hump and win it all. Perhaps one day this dream could become a reality. But even if the Rays never win a championship, I'll still be here watching them play, as I've always been watching all these years. Ever since I was just a boy, I've been growing up with this team. From that World Series game in 2008, to seeing Garza's no-hitter, to finding out the next morning about game 162. I was in elementary school at the time. There was no way I was staying up until midnight on a school day. Even as the team fell out of relevancy during the mid-2010s, I kept watching, even going on the road to see them play in other cities. I had a dream to see them play in every major league stadium, and so far, every year, me and my family have been able to see them in at least one city. From Atlanta to New York, Chicago to Houston, Colorado to Los Angeles. I've been all over the country and stuck with the Rays through thick and thin. These past five years have been a crazy ride, from the highs of the World Series run to the heartbreak of the wildcard exits. There truly is no telling what will happen next, but ultimately... I'll keep watching this team, no matter what. To my dad, the man who got me into watching baseball in the first place, gone with me on all these trips, and to whom this entire series is dedicated to. Thank you for sitting by my side and enjoying baseball with me for all this time. The greatest memories truly are the ones where it's just me and you on the couch watching this team together. And so, thank you to the Tampa Bay Rays, the most interesting team in baseball.